Tanya Sagachian, you produced Jane Campion's The Power of the Dog based on the novel by Thomas Savage about a rancher who torments his new sister-in-law in, -law in uh, 1920s Montana. Uh, what were your initial thoughts about this story and the book when they were first brought to you? Well, the book was first brought to me by Jane um, and that was in May 2017 and I've lived and breathed it every day since then. Um, so it's something I've thought about in great depth. Um, I, I fell in love with it overnight. I, it's very, very rare when you get given a piece of material for you to feel um, that it, it has a complete self to, to its, its shape and structure and that there's an inevitable but surprising ending. And I think that's the thing you're always looking for as a producer, something that can take you on a journey which um, it feels really honest and true, but also uh, upends you at the end. And I had goosebumps and on my neck when I put the final page down but more importantly than that for me was the fact that Jane had given it to me and um, you know Jane is such a trailblazer in our business she's a, a, a woman who has carved her own voice and her own mastery of cinema over the last um, 30 years I guess and was a huge influence on me as a filmmaker We'd met 10 years previously when I read her script for Bright Star and um, I'd been running the funds of the UK at the time, the National Film Funds, and I was able to invest in it and get to know her. And we immediately formed a kind of creative synergy with one another. And she was really keen for us to be able to, to find something to work on together again in film. But that being 10 years previous and uh, she'd made television since then. So I was really keen to get her back into cinema and get it back into filmmaking. But we both looked at one another and said, neither of us are men, neither of us American. This is a Montana story. Um, and it was really, really important to us that we were able to kind of uh, embed ourselves in that thinking and do a lot of research and understand where Savage writing this extraordinary book had got his influences from and what it had felt like because the book felt like it was something that really had lived experience in it. So very early on we went to Montana um, and we met his family and we went to the ranch uh, where he'd grown up and where he'd experienced lots of the things that we think had influenced the drama of the book and the, the book has a lot of um, mystery in it and psychological tension so we wanted to be able to capture that in the landscape and uh, and in the way in which we approach building and structuring the story. Um, and we went to visit Annie Prue uh, because Annie Prue had written the afterword for the, uh, for the novel when it had been republished. And we kind of got her blessing on how to interpret this story. And we felt having done that, that it was okay that people so different from the writer himself would be able to uh, embody and take that story on. Uh, and, you know, Jane Campion uh, has such a, a storied career, of course, uh, but she's not the first director you'd necessarily think of for uh, the Western genre, and this feels like a very different take on it. Uh, what, what do you feel that, like, in, you know, over the course of making this film that she brought to it that was uh, especially fresh and unique to, to her own vision? Well, I think in a way it's set in the West, but really it's more of a psychological drama. I mean, it's a Western without guns. Uh, it's really complex in its layering of the four central um, protagonists who uh, are played brilliantly, I think, in the film by Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, Jesse Plemons, Kirsten Dunst and Cody, Cody Smith McPhee. And it's um, that there, there, there are a series of um, movements within the film that really dig into desire, love, isolation, repression, gender expression, what society forces you to be, the danger of prejudice, what happens when you're isolated and alone and vulnerable. Um, and all of these are themes that she's a master of handling. So for me, it was quite exciting actually to have Jane make a film with a male protagonist at the center, but where she was able to dig in and unearth kind of the kind of vulnerabilities and sensitivities that you wouldn't necessarily imagine would take place on a, a ranch in the American West and to do it with the kind of sensual and visual filmmaking that is her signature.
Um, and you know, you mentioned uh, uh, this this really excellent cast. Uh, but you know, over the course of any number of productions, you know, there there you know people's schedules change, and so there were some cast changes behind the scenes of this. Uh, you know, Elizabeth Moss and Paul Dano had been attached. Uh, you know, what what what's what's it like, kind of balancing all of that out, and 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 you know, kind of keeping things on track as people's schedules are changing and changes are, are needed. Yeah, I mean, I think all the producers on this round table will tell you that's one of the, the, the real challenges is trying to get everything to magically come together on the dates you need it, it, it to work out with. And it, we did lose um, Lizzie and Paul on, on the way, but actually we were very lucky because um, we got Jesse and Kirsten, who in, um, in actual fact, Jesse had initially been our first choice for the part, but his schedule hadn't enabled us to make that happen. And at the time, uh, Kirsten had said, I can't believe, Jesse, you're going to be the one who's um, who's going to be in the Jane Campion film because Jesse and Kirsten also live together in real life. Um, but then, obviously, when the opportunity arose, Kirsten was the absolute first choice for us. And it was great to be able to work with the two of them together and for them to bring that extra um, quality of um, shared experience to the film and to ground it in this real... American heartland, which they were able to bring. I mean, the other challenge we had as producers uh, casting this film is, of course, we structured it as a New Zealand uh, Australian co production, which meant that both in terms of casting and crew, we really had to try and do the best we could to work with people from those territories. So we had some exemptions for the leads because obviously. Um, that was going to be critical in terms of getting the right people to play those parts. But, uh, but that was also an additional challenge that we faced when we were looking at who we would and wouldn't be able to use. Um, and, you know, the biggest logistical challenge of all, COVID, uh, you know, this, this film had a, a break in the middle because of lockdowns. Uh, what was it like sort of, you know, what were you thinking when, you know, production had to pause and, you know, were you thinking, is this ever going to, come together or, you know, what, what's kind of going through your head during that process? Yeah, I mean, COVID hit, hit us for six. You know, we were in New Zealand, which was the country that seemed to have done the best job of uh, protecting itself from, in, you know, infection. Um, and we've managed to shoot all of our exteriors down in the South Island, which is where we had, you know, located the, the ranch. And actually the, the whole putting together of that production was, probably harder than what happened when COVID struck us because we had to build an entire world that was, we had to build our own period in Montana in New Zealand. Grant Major, who did a phenomenal job, has never ever been to America. Um, we were in very, very tricky conditions and we um, had three months to, to build everything from scratch in weather conditions that felt like they were never ever going to relent and enable us to do that. So. The minute we finished our location shooting, we thought, well, nothing, um, nothing can go wrong now. We've managed to, we've managed to just get that in the can. We'll just do our interiors and we'll be away. And um, and then all of a sudden, the um, infection rate in New Zealand um, escalated, and the country shut down. We had forty eight hours to get everyone home and safe, and we had no idea how long it would take. Um, because we didn't know whether it would be possible for a vaccine to be invented. So it was, um, it was a real challenge, but we had a, a steadfast crew, an extraordinary um, line producer in New Zealand, Chloe Smith, who was absolutely amazing at keeping the possibility of the film going together, as were my producing partner, Seesaw. And, um, and when we got back together and everyone came in, um, there was a real family spirit. It's what Tamar was talking about. Everybody really wanted to finish the film and, um, and it gave it an extra energy and an extra sense of purpose, I think. Uh, now, over the course of your career, you've uh, worked on everything from independent films all the way up to Harry Potter. Uh, mm -hmm. How different is it kind of, you know, is it a completely different animal realizing uh, a smaller film as opposed to uh, like a blockbuster with, uh, so many more moving parts. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's very different. But for me, the reason I do this is because I love filmmakers. And so in a sense, I love the stories and I love filmmakers. So my objective is to try and enable them to achieve their vision. So the difference is really to do with whether what, what toys they need, what requirements they need, what the story needs, who the financiers are. But actually, the bit I do is about trying to work out how you can best marry material with the artist and then work out how to provide an infrastructure that makes sense. Um, there's never enough money. It's amazing that even on the big film, films, you never feel you have enough money. But uh, I think the nicest thing is being able to pull together teams of um, cast and crew and, and individuals who just want to, um, to work with the filmmakers you're working with. And so like on this film, we got to work with Johnny Greenwood who did our score and did an amazing score, making this kind of period story feel very modern, uh, but also classical at the same time. But Johnny was also in, very briefly, in the Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, where he played one of the weird sisters. So sometimes you can get, um, you can get the strangest collaborations to reappear <laughs> across different films. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, congratulations on all your uh, collaborative work with the cast and crew of this film. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure talking with you about it and best of luck in, in the weeks and months to come as people see it. Thank you. Thank you so much.